uh, with about, uh, approximately 4,000 students. Out of 4,000 students, approximately 700 of them international students from approximately 50 countries. And uh, we have about 200 uh, academics. It's a non-profit organization, I mean a non-profit foundation. Uh, not a private university, but a non-profit university. Uh, we have a board of trustees. Um, this is a modern and a compact campus. Uh, actually, uh, here on the uh, right side, uh, you don't see it right now, mm, we have just uh, applied for a new project. It's about uh, more than a million uh, dollar uh, project. It's about uh, establishing a, a wind, uh, how do you call wind, uh, I mean for the uh, energy uh, thing, uh, the uh, wind roses we call, and also uh, some uh, panels, uh, I mean solar panels. Uh, we, there, there is a um, parking place for the students, but uh, just uh, uh, the solar panels will be covering the parking uh, place, so uh, well, a functional thing. And this is our main campus. There is also uh, another campus nearby, a few kilometers away, away and our medical school will be uh, constructed over there soon. Uh, there is also one more small campus. It is for the English Language Foundation class classes and also the graduate school is uh, located over there. It's near the, I mean in the city center, this uh, campus for the graduate uh, people because uh, our major campus is uh, a little bit away from the uh, city center in the, I mean uh, just in the middle of cotton fields. Uh, because the graduate people mostly are working, uh, so it is difficult for them to travel to the outer skirts of the city, so uh, we prefer them to go to the city center. And um, there, these are just uh, classes and uh, some facts and figures about the uh, physical situation. <coughs> We have uh, PhD programs and uh, master's programs. Uh, our faculties, the Faculty of Law, Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences, and we are representing right now <laughs> this faculty. And uh, we also have engineering faculty and architecture, engineering and architecture faculty, and Faculty of Arts and Science. And we also have a vocational school for uh, two years. Uh, there are also different uh, departments in that school. Um, yes, the master's programs and PhD. And the, the campus is, uh, because the campus is nearly established, all of the physical um, buildings and uh, almost everything is so new and uh, the facilities are enjoyed by the uh, students. Uh, there are so many activities run either by the students or by the university. Uh, these are just uh, pictures from the university, cafeterias and uh, dining places. If they don't like to eat uh, the meals that are served by the um, by the university, they can also uh, get some meals from uh, in-campus uh, stores. We also have a, a nice library. Uh, actually, as I mentioned, it's like a, a boutique university, small university. The uh, physical conditions are good, but uh, right now we're uh, expanding the total number of books and uh, ebook uh, number there, there there are some technological and research facilities for example 
uh, laboratories like uh, nanotechnology laboratories uh, within the engineering department, computer and science technology and electric and electronics uh, library, uh, I mean, uh, facilities. And uh, we also run research projects which are uh, funded by the government and Turkish uh, National Science Academy uh, and also uh, some uh, European Union. Uh, we are right now applying for some of the projects uh, as partners for the European Union projects. And uh, we have also some uh, partnership agreements with um, different universities, either from the European Union or from uh, USA, and also uh, from the uh, Turkic Republics in the Asian uh, area. We organize so many uh, uh, conferences, and also, by the way, I can also uh, announce you if you want to uh, present some papers and uh, just submit papers to the uh, Computing in Science and Engineering Conference. It will be held in, uh, actually this is a previous one, uh, it will be held this year, this, uh, uh, this June, this coming June, so uh, if you also consider it, uh, we can also talk uh, in, more late, uh, in more details later. So, uh, we, there's a, a big, we can say that because it's a non-profit uh, uh, university, uh, almost all, uh, I mean many of the students, here we can say that one or two students get scholarship from the university. I mean either 100% tuition fee or 50% or 25% uh, according to their uh, success level. Uh, if they, let's say that if they don't uh, pass from one uh, course, their scholarship is not uh, cut, uh, it continues. Uh, even if they cannot get a scholarship, they can even get a, a pocket money. And so it is very attractive for both local students and also inter uh, international students. So. Uh, all of the, the courses are taught in English and we also have an uh, Erasmus uh, agreement with many universities uh, so uh, if they study at this university they can spend a semester or a few months at other partner uh, universities and we have double degree program, programs as well with Leeds Metropolitan University. So these are the uh, examples of students from uh, I mean, uh, the flags from different uh, countries. So I guess uh, I don't need to get in more details. Uh, we have so many activities. Uh, okay. Just to give you an idea. Okay, this is our uh, campus. If you just visit us there, we'll be so happy to hosting you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kanda, for introducing uh, Ismail uh, Gideon University. Um, yeah, now to our academic panel. Um, first up is um, Dr. Gaye Gunger. She's assistant professor of international relations at Gideon University. And she received her PhD, as you know, from FIU in 2008. Prior to going or starting at Gates University, she actually received the very prestigious Max Weber Fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship at the European University Institute in Florence. And um, she has also been a lec visiting lecturer at Humboldt University, the University of Miami, University of Florida, and Vesalius College in Brussels in the past couple of years. Her research include interests include organization theory, legislative reform policy making, as well as political parties, both public opinions and elections. And her paper will be on the institutional basis of research-based innovation, industry, government, and university. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for uh, the introduction. Uh, yes, um, well, we're, um, I, from that, um, 
Professor Yang, and she didn't mention that I will just briefly mention that we established a new um, research group in our university and it's called MIREC, the Migration Research Group. And we have uh, five, we are represented by five different faculties and we're going to apply uh, for it to become a center. So that's another, um, actually one of our strongest areas because we have faculty members who work on migration and we're, um, we applied for um, the um, Erasmus Intensive Program, IP, of, on forced migration and we're hoping to get it. Uh, maybe when we, we're back we're going to hear the results. Um, and we have 12 partner universities from Europe. So we work towards mobility and hopefully we're a competitive European <coughs> And, and um, so this uh, paper is actually about the Turkish um, side of it uh, because my colleagues will cover more the European aspect and I will just um, cover the industry government and university cooperation at the Turkish level. Uh, but I'm, I haven't heard the definition of innovation. I don't know if I missed it, I apologize, but did anyone define at the previous panel? No. I mean, it's a buzzword and I think um, it's really hard to define now. But as you know, I mean, I don't want to steal their thunder because they will, uh, the economists, my economist colleagues will speak more about that and they will define it and dissect it and everything. But I will just briefly mention that, you know, it was uh, Schumpeter who first in, um, defined uh, innovation in back, back in 1934 and he associated it with economic development and um, defined it as a new combination of productive resources. But since then the concept has evolved significantly and it doesn't mean that anymore. And during the 1950s, innovation was considered to be a discrete process resulting from research carried by isolation, uh, isolated researchers, researchers in isolation. But today innovation is no longer um, perceived, understood as a process um, resulting from individual research uh, or separate individual activities. It is an interactive process of learning and exchange where interdependence between actors generates an innovative system. So it's a knowledge-based innovation. Today what we're talking about is a knowledge-based innovation uh, which requires not one but many kinds of knowledge and it also requires the convergence of many different kinds of knowledge retained by a variety of actors. So we need various actors. And here, of course, we talk about um, the industry science cooperation. And where does the government fit in this picture? With its, actually, in this new environment, of course, we can have cooperation, but cooperation doesn't necessarily lead to innovation. So what we need, the institutional basis, and that's where the government comes in. And in this, today's world, if you look at the European Commission's um, documents on innovation, the innovation strategy, and also the UK's big society uh, and many um, speeches and press releases by different European um, politicians and uh, technocrats, you can see that uh, innovation is a collaborative uh, effort, it has to be, and the government in this picture is a catalyzer. It's uh, uh, also a reactor. It brings together the industry and the science. And actually in Turkey there is this uh, new effort. And when, of course, innovation is not really my subject, but when Marcus um, mentioned about this conference, I became interested in And I started uh, reading and looking at the ministry website. And they, actually we, I will just show now, but um, the Turkish government is uh, planning to invest a lot in industry and science cooperation. So in, in these uh, 14 slides I will show you what, uh, what has been achieved so far and what are uh, they planning to do. So let me start the slideshow. Okay. 
So this is a new phenomenon. Um, we have regional summits and the first industry science cooperation regional summits were was held in, um, in Istanbul in 2012 and then in Kojeri um, and I attended on March 9, the one that was held in Izmir and um, we have now 10 universities in Izmir and all the presidents and um, the R&D departments in the universities were represented and it was more like a workshop. I was actually impressed because uh, we were invited, all the, of course, as a social scientist, I wasn't invited. It was the engineering uh, school uh, dean, and then the president, and the, he um, the board of trustees, the head of the board of trustees. But I said, I work on innovation, I have to go, please. <laughs> and so I attended, but of course, no mention of social sciences. <laughs> but it was all about technology, um, engineering, but it was very interesting because this was more like a, a thought process and it was more like a workshop. And now they're holding, I think, in tomorrow, right? Today is the 22nd. Tomorrow is in Antalya, also represented by, it's the region, you know, Turkey has uh, seven regions. And uh, so Izmir is the Aegean region and Antalya is the Mediterranean region. And all the universities uh, in that region, in Sparta and other uh, cities, will come to this regional summit. And there they will discuss um, the industry science cooperation. And so the, when we look at the institutional structure, uh, we have, which was now the Ministry of Science, Industry and Technology, previously known as the Ministry of Industry and Trade. So they got rid of trade. And now they have science, the first one, industry and technology. That shows the, um, where it's going, really. We really, um, even the name change shows the, um, the motivation that science and industry should be hand in hand. And um, the general directorate of science and technology actually works really hard. And that's where all the um, support and all the stimulus packages and fundings actually uh, are developed. And we have the TÜBİTAK is our uh, scientific and technological research council. Uh, small and, of course, we know the importance based upon the small and medium enterprises. And we have development agencies for big cities and also for regions. These are the support programs that I want to mention briefly. Uh, we have the technology development zones, they are called technology parks or techno parks. And we have the industrial thesis supporting program, SAMTES it's called. Uh, this is all in the science and in the engineering faculty, obviously. Exemptions and supports. Um, so when we look at these, it's just, I'll um, go through quickly. This law entered into force in 2001. And um, this fosters the establishment of techno parks uh, to enhance knowledge circulation and high advanced technologies. I'm not going to read, you can see. Um, so, this is the uh, main financial support mechanism actually um, provided by the Ministry of Science. And the most important part is that the foreign firms can take part in this. It's actually encouraged that they uh, come and uh, work with the local firms or the national firms uh, to become shareholders in managing um, this uh, techno, techno parks. And um, there are income and corporate tax exemptions um, from the, for the managing company, for the software, uh, for the salaries of the researchers, and uh, that value added tax exemptions. So, uh, as of March 2013, there are 49 technoparks established and um, 2,138 firms. Uh, when we look at the R&D staff, it's, it's increasing, but of course I don't want to give any data because they will compare the Europe, um, Turkey's R&D investment and uh, personnel with the European ones, so I'll, I'll, I won't go into that. And the um, 
322 patent applications which were accepted. Um, so an, another law provides a range of fiscal in incentives for R&D activities. Uh, this is the support mechanism for the R&D centers. Um, there, let me show you this. Um, there are minimum requirements for R&D uh, center <coughs> certification. And this is just um, some, of, I mean, some of them, but 50 full-time uh, R&D personnel, implementation of R&D activities in Turkey. This, is also, this also involves the um, foreign co uh, companies. And these are the uh, incentives and exemptions. I can, I mean, if you're interested in, I can share you, uh, I can send you the slides, so you don't have to read all these small prints. So, uh, when we look at the figures as of March again, we have 138 enterprises from 13 different sectors and about 15,000 R&D staff and 1,079 patents. This is another program, Techno Initiative Capital Support Program. Um, this is, it's actually up to 100 and, uh, well, 55,000, 100,000, Turkish year and 55,000 um, dollars. This is for doctoral and master's students. And finally, this is the Industrial Basis Supporting Program. Um, actually, we have some master's students and the engineering faculty are applying for this round. We'll see how many get is gets. Uh, since we're a new university, we don't have any right now, but we're hoping to get one. So the project, um, the ministry supports 75% of the project budget, and the rest is covered by the uh, by the company. Um, so far, there are 1,566 projects uh, eligible and 102 million Turkish lira uh, has been allocated for this uh, program. Okay, I'll stop here because Mark showed me. <laughs> yes. yes, and um, of course I'll be happy to answer your questions afterwards. Thank you. She's assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Guinness University, and um, she has also had, had a previous post and degree from Istanbul Technical University, um, and uh, she worked at the University of Utah as research assistant and lecturer. For yeah, I did my PhD there. Perfect, and you got your PhD there, right? In addition to that, you worked on an international project funded by the Ford Foundation, and has you have contributed to the UN's Women's Progress of the World's Report on trade and social policy issues. So um, your paper is going to be on, or her paper is going to be on the politics of innovation, a case study on the EU's 2020 and Turkey's vision 2023. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us and hosting us here. It's great to be in Miami with you. And before I start, I should state that I'm a kind of a <laughs> presenter position for this paper. I'm the co-author of the next paper with Burak. Uh, but my colleagues could not make it to Miami, so I I am volunteering for them to uh, present their work. I'll, I'll try my best, but in case you have questions, we can discuss all together. And this paper is about the politics of innovation, EU versus Turkey. And it tries to understand Turkey's research and innovation approach, and does this with a special reference to Turkey's EU process. So in the pro uh, EU uh, negotiations, accession negotiations, and the methodology is studying two different approaches: the EU's Horizon 2020, as you all know, and Turkey's 2023 Vision Report. And as we can say, Turkey's research and innovation impulse has been shaped greatly by EU accession process. And it is the least problematic part of the accession, uh, which is kind of surprising. <laughs> but 
but it is the best part in uh, with respect to different chapters. And overall objectives, when we look at EU Horizon 2020, we see that it's a strategy for growth and jobs, uh, with the focus on growth and jobs. And uh, there is also the emphasis on financial instrument implementation of innovation agreement. Uh, Turkey's vision 2023 is introduced by the uh, AKP uh, government. And it's a society project. It's intended to bring different stakeholders under the vision of scientific and technological developments. And as also Guy emphasized, we see a shift towards science and technology and co uh, collaboration. And uh, there is a reference to Japanese and European examples. As I said, it is closely related to the European accession process. And when we look at aims, the aim of Horizon 2020 is mainly to simplify research and technical development programs under one set of rules. So bringing everyone together under a uh, single title. And of course, uh, the idea is to decrease bureaucracy and setbacks in the, program, in the uh, process. And the major goal is to secure Europe's global competitiveness. And there's a focus on R&D and industrial development. In the Turkish case, we see that the idea is to bring together again different projects under a single title that's similar. And also the idea is to increase competitiveness uh, in the international arena. And especially the focus is on increasing the share of high value products in total industrial uh, output. And objectives continued excellent science, competitive industries and industry leadership, and better society. These are the major objectives in the EU case. And in Turkey, again, competitive advantage, increasing living standards. I would say sustained development is more than sustainable and securing growth and use of science and technology to overcome societal challenges. And when we look at here, um, the major difference, we see many similarities, but the major difference is that in the EU case, being a developed country group, the focus is on securing industry leadership with the BBS and Japan, uh, versus in the Turkish case, being an emerging economy, the focus is on growth and sustaining development. So that's the main difference. Let's now look at the priorities in these two approaches. In both cases, we see education, research, and innovation as the main priorities, not surprisingly. And the third one is also similar across two cases, social inclusion and poverty reduction in UK, case, and in the Turkish case, balanced income distribution. Um, but in the EU case, we also see climate and energy, the environment concern more openly stated, which is missing in the Turkish case. Again, not surprising, Turkey is an emerging economy, the focus is on growth, so environmental concerns are secondary. And when we look at the two programs with respect to the challenges specified, um, you see a long list here, <laughs> as you can see. Um, I will just give the general idea between the two cases. In the EU case, as you see, we see a more open uh, reference to environmental concerns again. Each title is related to one way or the other environmental concerns. In the Turkish case, we have a detailed list of titles ranging from uh, space and defense technologies to health and life sciences, transport, also environment, but as you see, we have a more broad, we have a broader list of uh, topics here, so it is not well articulated, I would say, and in the Turkish case, in the EU case, it is more focused on uh, one aspect. Again, this is parallel to the growth emphasis, not surprisingly, and we see specific targets for the year 2020 in the EU case, and this is from the Horizon 2020 document.
For example, the employment rate of the population is expected to increase from 69% to 75%. Unemployment, no, not unemployment, sorry. Uh, investing in R&D, 3% of GDP, that is the goal. And Turkey is way behind this number, by the way. And reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 20%, increasing energy efficiency by 20%, Increasing the share of renewable resources to 20%, and also reducing poverty across Europe uh, by 25%. As you see, we see very detailed uh, targets in the EU horizon uh, approach. In the Turkish case, we do not have specific targets, so they are they are very broad. And just to say to say one. The, gov the government says we should in, uh, decrease unemployment to 5%, which is around 9% these days. And besides that, we don't have any specific target listed. This part is important, kind of looking at two approaches with respect to their similarities. And we see that there is a market-driven nature in both cases. So we see the partnership of state and private sector. Uh, and to close the gap between research and market, so to, to link them together. And this is parallel to Gaia's uh, university industry uh, partnership emphasis in the Turkish case. And we also see a focus on small and medium sized enterprises in both cases. And especially with the crisis, uh, small and medium sized enterprises are seen as a source of innovation and growth to address societal challenges, social concerns raising with the crisis. And internationalization of SMEs are encouraged. And parallel to that, the idea is improving the conditions for SMEs, um, securing their institutional framework better, and improving the conditions for intellectual property rights etc. And also in the Turkish case, SMEs are uh, emphasized a lot because um, in the in emerging markets case, it is almost 99% of all firms listed as SMEs. Even if their share is not that large in output, still they play a very important role. And finally, international cooperation is emphasized in both cases. In the European case, um, the emphasis is that the Union needs a more integrated approach uh, to get closer to third countries. And they classify these countries as industrialized and emerging economies, and enlargement and neighborhood countries, and developing countries. And parallel to this, Turkey and EU has many cooperations in research and development. I won't list the whole thing, but there are almost um, 20, 25 programs where we have cooperations with EU. So this is the area where we establish close links with the European Union. As I said before, Turkey's research and development uh, policy or industrial policy is closely linked to the EU accession process. So negotiations were a big starting point for this shift. And it started with the 2001 national program. And the two, uh, two chapters, one is science and research chapter, and the other one is enterprise and industry policy chapters. These are the areas where we have very positive progress. And I won't enter the details, but just a great summarize. Um, again, we see an emphasis on SMEs especially in the enterprise and industry policy uh, program. The idea is to ch have structural changes in production to increase the share of high value products. And in that respect, I won't talk about this because Guy nicely covers. We have different institutions like POSCA <coughs> that supports small and medium sized enterprises. We have to be the uh, Science and Technology Council, which supports projects for innovation. 
So we have different, uh, in, we had big institutional changes in the last 10 years. Finally, my conclusions. As I said, in both cases, we have a market-driven approach and competence is a driving factor in both approaches. And social considerations are emphasized, but a bit overshadowed by market-driven uh, approach. And especially in the EU case, we see it more emphasis on environmental concerns, but in the Turkish case, it is more secondary. The emphasis on, is on growth and development. Um, and we find, I can say that this is shift from market liberalization to industry policy activism in the new era. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, and it seems like you co authored with um, your colleague, Dr. Mohamed Burak Ganini, um, the next paper, which is called Drivers of Innovation in an Emerging Market Context Evidence from Turkey. Dr. Mohamed Burak Ameni has a PhD actually from Kansas State University in 2010, is assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Gates University right now, and his research interests lie in fields of industrial economics, regulation economics, statistics theory, and applied yeah. economics. Thank you. Drivers of Innovation in an Emerging Market Context, Evidence from <coughs> Turkey. This is, right now, is unfinished paper because we uh, just started actually like a couple of months ago. Uh, so, still, paper continues. So, since both Nursan and I'm economist, as you know, economists like models, <laughs> and we uh, set out models, they don't work, and we replace them with the new ones. Uh, our <laughs> uh, claim to find the truth, draw from those models never ends, but hopefully we will find. But this is not like that type of presentation, because uh, when we, come, when we uh, learn to idea to come here, we knew that this is quite interdisciplinary, uh, conference or a small panel, so we just forget all the models and what the economist says, but especially neoclassical models and all derivatives, first order conditions, second order conditions, none of them is here. This is just a very descriptive picture what's going on. Second thing is, uh, so far, both Guy or Norsha's presentation, always we look at the uh, concept of innovation from the perspective of government or public sector. But actually, the problem we are looking at is basically happening in the entrepreneurship sector. So, our objective here to take a picture of what is going on in the, uh, in the real sector. So, we have a nice survey asking many questions uh, uh, uh, different uh, enter entrepreneurships from different sectors, and it is they been they have been asked that what uh, drives their uh, productive RD RD and innovation performance, or what what uh, factors stop them. So, as I say, this is just a definitive uh, descriptive. Uh, so, in a rapidly changing international economic environment, innovation has become the pathway to increasing international uh, competitiveness. Uh, the competitive conditions uh, have significantly changed in the EU market, especially after the increasing importance of China uh, in those markets with the phase out of MFA. Uh, Turkey is a particularly interesting case to investigate with 
its proximity to the EU as its main trading partner. So this paper aims to study the determinants of innovation uh, in, the, in the case of Turkey using my credible data. So we first present the descriptive picture of the innovation activities decision of firms located in Izmir. Uh, we then set out an uh, econometric model, but we are not done yet that part, so I am going to just briefly give the model and what we are trying to do with that. So, uh, the outline of presentation is first we are going to look at innovation concept, of course, uh, like every uh, economist who, like, uh, who wants to talk about innovation, I am going to mention Schumpeter. So, uh, then to a little bit theoretical uh, framework. Then we have this nice uh, develop, Izmir Development Agency field analysis of the regional innovation strategy survey. And I'm going to look at its findings. Then lastly, uh, I'm going to show you what, what we are going to do next. Schumpeter defines innovation as a process of creation, uh, creative destruction. Actually, the date here is not correct, but uh, that is uh, creative destruction is in the book of uh, Capitalism, Socialism, and uh, the book published in 1942, but his earliest uh, writings also it is, uh, include the concept is included. Uh, actually, the uh, innovation as a concept is not the just creation of the new product but also it is commercialization of the pro product or the creation of new system, the improvements in the existing product and the applica application of existing product, service or process to another field or sector. Therefore it covers uh, the whole stage from the introduction to the idea to the uh, the, uh, the introduction of the product to the market. So, when we say innovation, uh, nearly it covers everything. I mean, how we are going, when we talk about uh, the concepts, first we should be uh, sure about everybody understands everything from one concept that we mentioned. So, innovation takes Two major forms based on a OECD's definition is technological product innovation or technological process innovation. And basically, actually the former one uh, seems more difficult than, than the second one. So, a technological product innovation refers to the implementation or commercial, commercialization of a product with improved performance characteristics. So this is either a technology, this can be a technologically new product or it could be a improved, technologically improved product. On the other hand, technological process innovation refers to the implementation or adoption of new or significantly improved methods of production or product delivery. So either change in equipment, production, organization, human resources, working methods or combination, all of those. Uh, or they can be derived from the use of new knowledge or, or improvement of know-how. So, uh, both in, uh, the innovation uh, can, both internal and external processes uh, are feeding the concept. Uh, internal factors refer to training, learning by using and learning by searching. On the other hand, external factors refer to learning by interacting. So, uh, governments play, of course, an important role uh, by stimulating the development of industrial or technological capacity. Um, internal processes are captured by firm specific factors, while uh, external uh, processes are measured by industry level. Uh, factors. As you see in the, uh, like when you want to conduct uh, micro level uh, research, it is hard to get uh, some of those information. So internal processes include, as I said, they include firm specific factors such as firm size, firm age, labor force qualifications, 
including the skill level of the workforce as well as the use of ICT in the firm. External processes refer to sector level measures such as market structures, first participation in international markets and potential learning sources. Uh, Firm size is expected to influence a firm's decision to innovate positively. Large firms can spread the fixed costs related to innovation activities over a larger volume of production, so they have more resources at disposal and they have easier access to capital markets uh, to finance their spending on innovation. They are more likely to be able to employ highly qualified employees needed for innovation activities. So our uh, expectation for the firm size and innovation seems positively related. Market structure is another uh, cited important factor. Uh, firm, firms with greater market power are more likely to be able to finance their RD. Uh, activities. In case of collusion between firms, oligopolistic models like, such as oligopolistic market structures may negatively affect. So, it is uh, there are two different effects here. Profit is another one, uh, and again, profit uh, can uh, affect in two ways, two different ways. Higher profits mean higher internal resources, which in turn may imply higher probability for a firm to innovate. On the other hand, lower profits may act as incentive to mechanism for firms that are facing to likelihood to lose their market share. So this is also can increase the level of uh, RD activities. Uh, absorbing existing Technology is a common practice in developing countries in their innovation acti activities. So the stock of skilled uh, labor force and important measures, at it, especially the survey, given it is one of the biggest problems stated by the firms finding very qualified uh, employees to to uh, hire. So uh, I can. But globalization and trade liberalization and FDI, increased foreign competition is likely to induce firms to innovate in order to gain or at least protect their market shares. On the other hand, foreign, uh, foreign direct investment may foster innovation again, uh, but also uh, negative effects are possible. So since I'm in short, short of time, I want to move to the survey. So, although Turkey uh, lags behind EU 27 countries in innovation activities, it is among the catching up countries and is a moderate growing country. Uh, now, the share of the GDP, uh, RD, uh, innovate, uh, RD activities to GDP is about 0.8%, 0.9%, it is not very high. but. Uh, actually, when I look at the numbers, like the last 10 years, it increased more than double. So, comparatively, it is getting more and more important. Uh, so, there are studies like checking those uh, relations between uh, which factors, uh, how they increase, uh, affect the innovation. Uh, for example, uh, Uzun finds that uh, large firms are more likely to inno innovate. Uh, Osteric and Taimans time time find uh, process of innovation and RT activities play an important role increasing in turn international competitiveness. Uh, shows that trade liberalization had a positive impact on innovation. Uh, and uh, so, we have this survey, actually this was the point that I want to talk because it, is, it shows what firms think what's going on in the real sector. Uh, based on the 2000 <coughs> course of 760 firms from 20 sectors, which can be categorized under four groups. Uh, those comes from information and communication sector, electricity 
gas steam and air conditioning, manufacturing and water supply industry. And the third way attempt to shed light on innovation performance of a large number of enterprises. Uh, there are questions regarding enterprise characteristics, including their legal status, age, location, uh, their sectoral distribution, whether they have an RD uh, department or not, the share of RD staff in the average number of employees, and the share of RD expenditure in the average revenue. Uh, actually, these are uh, the definitive picture of what's going on there, but also there are questions like uh, the question asking to evaluate their innovation and RD performance, how, how they find their performance on the issue and what, uh, what make them successful, what, make, uh, what factors stop them uh, to innovate. Uh, 62% of the firms are less than 10 years old. This is not surprising because maybe you are not aware of but Turkey has a huge financial crisis in, to, in the year of 2000. Many firms went to bankruptcy, so it's catching up and healing process. Uh, most, uh, 42 of the firms are family enterprises, so we expect like they are more traditional based uh, firms. Uh, most of the firms are located inside the city residential area, so uh, uh, it seems they are quite independent from each other, so the same sectors can do not uh, distribute on the same area uh, like that. So only 15% of the firms have an RD department, uh, but I'm sure that like if 10 years ago we had even the same uh, survey, it, the answer would be more to, I'm not sure if it, it could ex, have exceed like 3% or 2%. So, the share of RD employees in the total employment is nearly 4.5%. The share of RD expenditures in total revenue is only 4.7%. Uh, the share of debt introduced new or significantly improved developed goods or services is not that bad, nearly 24.8%. Of course, this depends on the answers given by the firms. They may think they are, they are uh, improved or developed goods and services, but maybe they are not really. So, the share of new goods and services for the market in total revenue is 26%. Uh, maybe uh, only 106 firms received financial support, so it seems that uh, in their RD uh, adventure they are quite alone, many of them. 43% uh, of the laws were not successful. Uh, they listed uh, lack of equity capital. 26% Person stated that economic crisis was the reason of unsuccessful uh, innovation, uh, and 15 percent listed like specialized labor force and knowledge as the main reason behind their failure. Uh, are the uh, the share of the firms with entirely new uh, product innovation is since 35.3 percent and the share of firms with product improvement is 43.3%. Uh, however, 25.3% of the enterprises do not uh, find their innovation and RD performance satisfactory. Uh, the share of firms that finance their innovation activities through equity capital is 41.3%. The share of firms that implement innovation-oriented performance system for their employees is 32%. Uh, and the share of firms that uh, state the government implement an effective and easily accessible support system for innovation is only 16% uh, Also, <laughs> nothing, uh, that survey also asking what is the barriers. And they stated that nearly 36.5% of the enterprises stated that they are not having sufficient knowledge on innovation management. 
5% of the enterprises not having knowledge on intellectual property management and 45% uh, of the enterprises think that having weak relationship and network with universities and other research audience. Uh, and also a few numbers. What is next from you? Just have a second. So far we didn't do anything. Uh, we just look at the picture. Now we are going to look at what determines this is just logic model. I mean it's very natural to us, but we can just and uh, one of the papers uh, presented here used logic model not replace. So uh, here uh, pi i is the uh, probability of uh, successful uh, innovation activities and uh, we are using this model to uh, so the our dependent variable is going to be take only two values zero or one say if it is successful it is one if it's not successful zero and now we are going to regress all other all the answers like uh, given in the survey and see how much each factor increases the success or how much each factor leads to uh, explains the failure. Uh, thank you very much. So last but not least, we have Dr. Funda Yashan. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Management at Gates University. And uh, she has a quite unique PhD I never heard before, came across before a PhD in International Shipping, Transportation and Logistics from the Institute of Marine Studies in the University of Plymouth in Plymouth, UK. Um, she also um, worked at the main maritime academy in the US for a couple of years, taught there, and published a number of publications, amongst other in Springer Publishers, Ashgate, and so on and so on. Um, so we look forward to hearing your paper on innovation and energy saving tools, sustainable green buildings. Thank you. First of all, let me tell you something. Uh, actually, this paper, after about the, I mean, after uh, our colleagues' papers, this is a little bit different from that uh, approach. <laughs> uh, this paper is mostly based on the practices from the market and also something about uh, innovative, uh, something that could be uh, uh, accepted as innovative. Uh, practices in the market. So, as you can see from the uh, presentation topic, uh, innovative and energy saving tools. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, talk about something, uh, mention about uh, energy saving things and also uh, what we understand from uh, efficiencies, resource efficiencies, and energy uh, efficiencies. For, uh, first, we can ask this question. Why is resource efficiency so important in today's world? Well, the, uh, we always uh, talk about it and uh, we always consider this fact. Uh, we can say that uh, natural uh, resources uh, underpin the functioning of the European and global economy as well as the quality of life. And these resources include especially raw materials and these raw materials, uh, which are known as uh, fuels, uh, such as fuels, uh, minerals, metal, metals, uh, food, soil, uh, water, uh, air and ecosystems. Here uh, we can say that intensive use of world's uh, resources puts uh, pressure on the planet and threatens the security of supplies, and, and as we all discussed them from decades. Uh, if current trades continue, trends uh, continue with this rate, we can say that uh, global population will be expected uh, to have grown by uh, approximately 30% uh, to around 9 billion people uh, by the year uh, 2050. So uh, th we can imagine that this will cause a real problem uh, and some aspiration of the welfare and consumption levels of uh, developed countries by the people of the emerging and developing economies. So uh, this is the situation. So in response uh, to these changes, uh, increasing efficiency will be the key concept um, to secure growth 
uh, in both for the uh, European Union and other developed economies by uh, improving uh, productivity, decreasing uh, costs and boosting the competitiveness in uh, all over the world, uh, especially the developed countries. Uh, more specifically, we can say that according to the uh, Europe uh, 2020 strategy and the flagship uh, initiative uh, for a resource efficient Europe, these conditions require to be fulfilled. And these conditions are technological improvements, as we all know, a significant transition in energy, industrial, agricultural and transportation systems, and changes in behaviors of producers and consumers in order to save uh, those uh, raw materials and also in order to be more efficient. Well, we can say that it has become uh, necessary uh, to develop new products and also uh, new services uh, and find ways of uh, reducing inputs and increase the uh, and improve the outputs by uh, as you see, reducing costs, minimizing waste, improving efficiencies, changing consumption levels, uh, optimization production processes, improving, improving business methods, and uh, improving logistics services, and improving green technologies, uh, sustaining international trades and international trades within the European Union, and opening up to new markets, to new areas, and focusing more on sustainable uh, products. At this point, we can say that innovation issues play vital role, roles in achieving these goals. So, uh, according to Europe uh, 2020 uh, blueprint and the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, the EU emphasized and recognized that Innovation is one of the major critical tools that can bring up the uh, existing, uh, that can bring the, the European Union common market economies a synergy to boost up the existing leading economies uh, in the globe and not uh, be negatively uh, affected from the domino effect situation arising from uh, interdependent uh, economies. <laughs> So, uh, Horizon 2020 framework program for resources and uh, innovation has included the adoption of uh, policies for innovation and technological improvement uh, within the EU, and also uh, in order to I mean, uh, in order to secure the EU's uh, global competitiveness. And uh, according to Horizon 2020 uh, framework. This combines all research, uh, totaling up to approximately 80 uh, million uh, uh, euros, to place some programs for research and innovation between uh, 2014 uh, until 2020 under the activities of uh, both competitiveness and innovation framework <coughs> program, which is also called CIP and the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, which is also called uh, EIT. Uh, and uh, we can say that the, uh, we can uh, just highlight the mission of the European Institute for uh, Innovation and Technology, technology at this point as uh, to increase the EU sustainability growth and competitiveness by reinforcing uh, the innovation capacity of the EU uh, by also considering the fact of uh, improving uh, resource efficiency concept. Uh, well, uh, we can say that uh, it becomes necessary to focus on uh, some innovation, innovative and uh, energy saving uh, tools uh, in day, daily life. At this point, the uh, green building concept uh, from the uh, daily lives and uh, practices from the market or within the market as one of the uh, it could be one of the uh, innovative and uh, energy saving uh, energy uh, efficient solutions uh, and uh, they have ex exponentially been expanding uh, since the last two decades 
both in the USA, Canada, and uh, Northern uh, America, uh, Northern America, and also in Europe. Uh, involvement of uh, structural engineering and architecture fields. Uh, have been uh, prominent as well as considering the environmental and energy saving issues in this area. So what we understand from this, uh, we can say that market research has been uh, focused on real-time uh, operating costs of building structures, uh, where uh, energy consumption, water use, uh, occupant comfort, landscape management and construction material have been at the forefront of sustainability to develop green and innovative technologies. Uh, at this point, uh, we can say that this uh, study uh, is about uh, something uh, is about uh, to bring attention uh, to focus on structurally oriented uh, green buildings uh, to highlight recent and innovative developments aiming sustainability and. Um, energy saving uh, tools in uh, I mean, uh, sustainable team energy saving. Uh, I'm uh, skipping those. <coughs> I mean, we can also say that the purpose of this uh, green buildings uh, is to have efficiently using energy, water and other resources, protecting the occupant uh, health and uh, improving employee productivity and reducing waste, pollution, and environmental uh, degradation. And, uh, we can also mention something about this. Uh, in order to achieve these uh, green buildings, uh, in order to achieve the benefits and reduce the costs arising from uh, life cycle assessments, uh, siting and uh, structure design efficiency, energy efficiency, material efficiency, indoor environmental quality enhancement, operations and maintenance authorization and waste reduction. Here, uh, the green, in terms of uh, building, green buildings, uh, some certain uh, practical issues that, uh, should be uh, evaluated uh, under some uh, regulations. For example, these uh, scientific evaluations are considered in order to be a building to become a green building. For example, I saw uh, 14,040 uh, Green Globes Rating System of the American National Standard and Green Building Protocol for Commercial Buildings and Green Building Standards Code and the LEED Certificate System uh, are all uh, considered authorized uh, issues in order to uh, green, uh, in order for a building to be considered as green buildings, so uh, ICF solutions, which is a very uh, specific method of building uh, green uh, buildings, uh, are just uh, mentioned from the uh, practice uh, practices in the market right now. Uh, ICF is uh, is defined as insulated car. Uh, insulated concrete form solutions with poured in place concrete walls surrounded by expandable polystyrofoam which is called EPS panels with reinforced uh, steel bars uh, and this is uh, one of the ways of uh, constructing buildings. Their, uh, the main purpose is to have energy efficiency uh, thermal comfort and construction uh, reduce the construction uh, costs. They are environmental friendly, uh, recyclable, uh, easy to calculate the life cycle of the building, and uh, which is uh, which leads to uh, have life assessment. I mean life cycle uh, situation. Uh, they are more uh, durable, faster to build, and easier to build. Uh, easier, easier to handle and construct, and walls are uh, walls offer uh, uh, superior energy efficiency and thermal uh, comfort, uh, more secure uh, compared to wooden buildings, and cost of the construction uh, may vary between 10% uh, 
or either 10% over or 20% under conventional building costs. Uh, we can say that the uh, applications are common in the USA, in Canada, in some countries in the European Union, for example, Norway, Sweden, and France, and a few examples are uh, in Turkey. Uh, let me just show you the, the pictures here. Uh, <coughs> is there a pointer here? Ah, yes. These are the EPS blocks uh, on the sides, and they are shape molded EPS blocks, and in, inside uh, steel bars. And uh, here, this is an application from the site. Uh, here, they are like Lego, uh, the toys that uh, the children play, right? They are uh, mounted uh, together like Lego toys. And uh, inside of them, uh, concrete is poured uh, on the site. Here, one example, uh, the uh, walls and doors open and uh, windows. Here, uh, some uh, concrete is just uh, being poured on the in, inside the wall. Another example here. Another example. This one, right? Uh, pictures. Actually, this one, uh, this uh, house is the only house in Izmir. <laughs> and, uh, that's the uh, only house. That's why I uh, always uh, took the pictures of it uh, from the beginning. Uh, they constructed the house within three months. And this is the nearly finished house. And this one I took the picture. <laughs> this is the uh, really uh, finished house. A uh, very durable and uh, energy saving situation. <laughs> and uh, one of the few in Turkey. But the total number is uh, increasing uh, so much in Turkey, but it only exists as the uh, only one in Izmir. And this is another example from the USA. Actually, schools and houses, uh, some public buildings are uh, some examples. Another example. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.
wondering how much of this growth and innovative, um, innovative initiatives, the ones you described are Turkish initiatives, and there's great Turkish investment. I wonder how much is public sector and private sector, and then I wonder how much FDI um, is contributing to innovation, foreign direct investment, as well as domestic, and how the public private um, sector right now. So that's my first question. And then my second followed up on the last presentation. You might have mentioned that there's a governing building that I was wondering because in the U.S. there's the U.S. Green Building Company that gives silver platinum to hold the greens and then maybe there's some tax deductions and incentives or something like that for businesses and they develop. And I was wondering are there rankings or is there an agency that's ranking type of building and getting some incentives such as the U.S. model? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. One question which follows up on my presentation by um, the special economic zone
pioneering roles, especially coach, uh, family, and vet uh, survivors. There are two major uh, uh, families. Uh, the businesses are around the world by those uh, families, but uh, they, uh, there are also many other uh, companies which are uh, worldwide uh, multinational uh, companies that have some alliances with other uh, I mean, uh, corporate merging system or uh, partnerships uh, with other uh, international uh, companies and uh, we can say that uh, their uh, expansion is so high right now that uh, both they in, uh, in attract the attentions uh, to invest uh, in Turkey and also uh, they go and uh, invest in other countries, for example, especially in Russia. Uh, there are so many uh, Turkish companies uh, having uh, construction uh, over Russia. They say that we have Russian friends, we, they all say that uh, Turkey has rebuilt Russia <laughs> uh, since the last decade. Uh, really, if you go to Moscow, for example, all buildings, the skyscrapers, they are all built by the Turkish uh, companies. Uh, so, if you just uh, travel to Turkey <laughs> soon, you will be able to see the uh, real uh, changes, both in Istanbul, for example, and also other areas uh, in Turkey. Uh, and also, something about logistics. Uh, uh, because uh, Turkey is located uh, geograph geographically in a uh, really sensitive uh, area, in the middle of, uh, in the eastern part of Europe, uh, in the western part of Asia, uh, in the southern part of Russia, uh, in the northern uh, part of uh, <laughs> Middle East and Africa. Uh, the positioning, the geographical positioning is uh, really so sensitive and so important, uh, fragile, yes, <laughs> so fragile. Uh, so the balance should be uh, made uh, accordingly. And uh, in order to uh, get uh, this, we can say that in order to get this wind behind us, <laughs> uh, it is really difficult to uh, uh, just uh, continue with this, uh, on this road. Uh, in terms of logistics, uh, yes, uh, the uh, market, I mean, the Turkey is uh, positioned in that area, and the logistics services, transportation services and connections between uh, west and uh, east and east and west uh, is really uh, improving so much. So in terms of logistic services, uh, so uh, good improvements uh, have been made. We can also see the reflections of the emerging and boosting economy uh, in this area as well. Maybe I can add a few more things about this. Uh, Turkey historically, like, uh, has its past 
I know the numbers in the United States are a bit different, but in the, when I get scale in Turkey, it's a very small city, I can say. But this uh, small town, the city, has like <laughs> at, least, at least like 70 or 80 uh, firms who uh, which uh, export like more than 100 countries. All right, so now actually the uh, capitalism in Turkey before it was like state-based capitalism in the past, like just few families that like you mentioned. Uh, like Koch family, Savanje family, and they have proceeds from the uh, government. Uh, but now there are many, many, many different uh, firms from this small region, and they are finding their own way. And this uh, helps Turkey find its way. Another thing is also government now tries not is not trying to solve every problem, but it is. Uh, sub substituting the things. For example, Turkish Airlines, for example. Turkish Airlines uh, is not, uh, does not have huge profits. Actually, in many cases, it's in the loss. But uh, Turkish government sees that in, in, from different perspectives, the loss is not important in that uh, point. So they can subsidize it. It's not important because now Turkish Airlines uh, is flying from one point to another point directly to many points and every day it is like uh, taking businessmen there, bringing them back and so basically uh, Turkey has now very uh, lively uh, capitalist sector uh, trying to take a part from everywhere. Uh, is it very clad or educated? No. They are just uh, brave uh, entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is the second wave. Uh, it started first in the 1980s. It was the first wave. 1990, it was problematic in Turkey. They were like uh, political uh, conditions, always crisis. But two, starting from 2000, I can say this is the second wave. So you can see Turkish businessmen everywhere. Uh, I mean, when I say Turkish businessman, not kebabs. Uh, <laughs> shops, I mean, <laughs> more special, on my more special guys. Uh, we, we call them as uh, Anato Anatolia, is the Asian part of Turkey. You know, Turkey is straight, uh, located on two continents uh, Asian part and uh, European part. The Asian part is called Anatolia. And we call these uh, business entrepreneurs uh, as Anatolian tigers. <laughs> and really, uh, because there's a uh, special, special tigers, real tigers uh, living in the Anatolian mountains, <laughs> which we never see, <laughs> but uh, they uh, live there. So uh, these uh, businessmen from the Anatolian towns and small places, they are really from energy. Uh, so if the bill by the, if it is right now uh, by law, uh, when uh, 2017 comes, uh, every building will be uh, inspected. If they have insulation uh, panels, uh, if they are insulated, then they will, be, they will have uh, a rating according to that. I mean, every apartment, every building will have a certificate of energy rating. According
according to that, if they are good enough um, insulated, then they will be uh, paying less uh, for their energy consumption. If they are not uh, insulated properly, so they will be uh, paying more money uh, for energy consumption. So that's the case. I was wondering about the ranking system because in the U.S. it's been a big component of corporate social responsibility and companies wanting to profile their mm -hmm. I'm sorry, could, could maybe you talk out? afterwards yeah. because we have other folks that also want to push. So it would be in the order they appeared, uh, Jane, Mark, and then Maria and Gali.
all this dilemma that you get the government support and then you do not become dependent on the government and you do not feel obliged to uh, support the government via your media groups or your employment preferences, stuff like that, because those groups, the Incargo groups, the Skoza and Turkish Airlines, they, get, they recruit people and then um, I don't know what are the criteria.
Finance Company is totally a different one. Uh, it is owned and operated, uh, a state owned and operated company. First of all, we have to take it uh, uh, separately. Uh, the others, uh, they, you say that they get benefits. How they get benefits? Uh, they get some subsidies. Uh, they cannot, they are not uh, directly financed by the government. That's a uh, different issue. I mean, if they uh, export goods, okay, they will be injured uh, VAT, for example. If they export more, according to that export uh, level, they, uh, they are exempt from some taxes, for example. Turkey wants to have uh, goods exported more, so this is not specific for Turkey, I mean, it's uh, all over the world. <laughs> I mean, uh, so uh, also the Turkish airline situation, it's a state-owned company, uh, the, uh, and um, the Turkish flag is, uh, that uh, is operated by the uh, government. If uh, there is uh, a loss, the government uh, is, uh, reimburses it uh, with the uh, major target and uh, providing service many fields, you know, uh, there are uh, millions of Turkish people living around the world, <laughs> not only in Turkey, uh, both uh, Tur real Turkish people, but also some mm, uh, roots, for example, in the Asian countries, uh, there are so many uh, <laughs> Turkish people, so uh, the Turkish airline company is uh, trying to reach those uh, specific points. That's why the company is uh, directly being subsidized by the government. Uh, but uh, in this case, we shouldn't uh, mix that situation with the uh, other private-owned uh, companies. Okay? I can also add very briefly. Uh, at this uh, regional cooperation uh, summit, what they emphasize is the transparency and objectivity for the selection criteria. So there is a move towards more and as uh, Kim mentioned, uh, it's not based on, there are no um, strings attached to those companies, really. One more short question, answer very please, short. and then we'll, I'm sure everybody wants to go to lunch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very short question, is in fact following your question, a lot of economy, and my question is, do you think that history and the, the, the, the rapidity of the growth of Turkey and the change of society and the coming of all of more on the like the revolution of coming from the, the country to the city growing has not also made the the, the number that you're giving that the women you said talking about women there's no more innovation there is a gap between coming straight away and having now a very big number so you need to take a little time and not be so sorry for having this gap because it takes time, I believe. And this very, very fast growth from Anatolia to the city, the growth of the city, the education to provide and the change of society can take a little bit more time. Yeah, so that's my question. You want to go to the question? Yeah, because it's still okay. um, quite short and longer. And it's not really about just education. It's not that lift your education to women and they <coughs> cultural barriers, we have these, uh, you know, societal pressures, so it is really, a, as you said, long-term process, for sure, but it's, it's really like, you know, uh, kind of, uh, how to say, this is all like uh, evolving process. But, but I think we still need to remember that even in Europe and even in North America, the percentage of women at the top of the leading Thank <laughs> you.